all of this, I still believe, really believe, prevention is possible. But it is not possible by educating people how to reduce their risk of being victimized alone. Just look at when it's up against the odds when we go to that strategy, how limited it is. Major social change is possible. Some of you are old enough, like me, to remember when cigarettes were advertised to children in cartoons. When the Marlboro Man was the embodiment of the sexy male. If you wanted to be sexy and look sexy, started with men, but then it was women. You had the cigarette, and every star had the cigarette. This was sexy. That's the same guy dying of lung cancer. That is the Marlboro Man, Wayne Marin, dying of lung cancer. We have to show the harm. Think recycling. You guys are so great here about that. But it wasn't long ago that no one thought about it. And it wasn't just a matter of educating individuals to recycle. There had to be policy changes, workplace practice changes. You had to make it simple. You had to make it expected, make it so that if you are using something that could be recycled, you think about where you put it. And you'd feel kind of odd if you didn't. That is a huge change in a very short amount of time from an accepted norm that no one even thought about changing. Same with things like drinking and driving. We still have a problem, but we've got a huge change in our thinking of this and our acceptance as a culture. The obesity campaign in the US, our first lady stepped up that helped, but it's not only about individuals getting out and exercising more, it's recognizing that, yeah, while I have to watch what I eat and how I exercise, when I've got an industry that makes it easier for me to buy, it's less expensive to buy really unhealthy foods and very difficult for me to buy the healthy foods or to quickly prepare them. And what's ease of access anytime I'm in a time crunch is unhealthy foods. And what our kids are marketed is unhealthy foods because what the big businesses make is money on unhealthy foods. If we don't deal with those systemic issues along with individual education, we're not going to get anywhere. It's got to be a combination. So let's go back to the brain. A young person's brain doesn't understand the long-term risk. The brain's job is to survive. Our children's thinking brain is just fine. But the risk assessment and impulse control is still under construction. In fact, it is not only a slogan that our biggest sex organ is not between our legs, it's between our ears. That's the reality. And it's still under development, even long after our bodies develop. And it develops differently, this is no big surprise, and it's not a joke, in boys and girls. And one of the differences is boys have a different hormone. And they have, with the INAH hormone, they actually start at puberty having seven surges of testosterone every day. Girls have the oxytocin. Oxytocin is to help with bonding and attachment for childbearing and attachment. So the girls are getting the bonding. They have testosterone too, and boys get some of the attachment, but they're at very different levels. We need to help them. It doesn't mean you can't control it. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means that boys are thinking capital P physical, physical small r relational. Girls are thinking large r relational, small p physical. Now we don't, and now clearly we have girls that are very, very, very sexually aggressive in ever increasing numbers and we have boys that are very capable and loving. So put this in a context. But there's a physical brain reason for this, along with, uh, along with the other things. So girls, in fact, it's the cuddle hormone. You don't see as many groups of guys needing to cuddle as you see groups of girls. And part of that, we all thought of the social part, the socialization, and certainly that's there. But there's also a brain component to that. So we need to help them understand their brain development, their physical development, and the social pressures in the toxic environment that we want to help them navigate. And all the reasons we care. We want to help them think about the difference between behaviors that are healthy, helpful, appropriate, respectful, and safe. What are ways that are OK to communicate? What are ways that are OK to touch? In 1976, I created something called the Touch Continuum that has unfortunately often been called good touch, bad touch. And I say very unfortunate because it was never meant to be that oversimplified. It was to teach children 
and adults the incredible importance of positive and nurturing touch and that if we have deprivation of touch, we will have failure to thrive. We need to learn how to touch. Part of the reason for the violence and part of the reason for risky sexual behavior is because we have touch-starved kids, desperate for connecting and not knowing how else to do it. And we teach them, don't touch. We need to be teaching them how to touch. We have media images that teach them to do body punishing sex when we don't know how to hold hands, hug, and kiss. We have a lot of adults in treatment, or that should be, because they've lost sexual arousal and desire. Because when you get too focused on sex and away from the larger sensuality and sexuality, it takes away the pleasure. So why don't we talk to kids about that? You know, one of the reasons I don't want you to jump into having sex too quick is it's not fun that way. It takes away your ability to have that pleasure, ultimately. We need to learn the difference between playful teasing and flirting where there's no intent to harm, and bullying and harassment where the intent is to harm and degrade. And then the kids added to me mutually inappropriate. They said, hey, lady, you're missing something. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, I usually am, and you'll usually tell me. <gasps> what about when it's OK for both of us, but you guys have a problem with it? And I went, you know, that's good. You guys might like the music you're listening to. You might think there's nothing wrong with your public display of affection. But if it is making everybody around you uncomfortable, or if it's in the middle of math class, it's not OK. Time, place, and manner. And that's true for adults, too. I still, as an adult, with lots of social supports and lots of assets in my life, need friends and loved ones to give me checks and balances. We need to help each other with our limits. We need limits on our media. We definitely need limits on our media use on all, not just the content of it. We should certainly be looking at the content of it, absolutely. But just, there's more to life. There's books, there's exercise, there's human beings. And to think about using our technology to aid humanity and to aid our connections not get in the way of it. To help our sons and daughters build on their strengths, to help them understand that this stuff is not normal, it's normal lies. See it, name it, call it out. I believe a really important counter to all of this is a four-letter word. <laughs> that usually gets teenagers' attention. Okay, cool. <laughs> and it doesn't start with that, it starts with L. And it's that love word. Because that's not what we see depicted in all this stuff. You don't see people looking at each other's eyes, holding each other's hands, holding each other in high regard and respect. You see a body being used as an object for somebody else to get off. That's very different. We need love, intimacy, and caring connections. I thought it was very interesting that the Finnish, in uh, one of their policies, said, we need outdoor advertising it should not be offensive to children. What if we had that standard, that our outdoor advertising would not be offensive to children, and that then those rules should apply to ads in windows? that should not be in public where children would see them. And they have an ombudsman for children. There was a big debate in Australia with a campaign from an American <coughs> company. This, the ads didn't run here. But when these ads were so explicit that people started calling this corporate pedophilia for the um, big department stores that ran them. And I thought, there you go. Hold them accountable. Oops, and I don't have it. I have it tomorrow. I'm sorry. I, don't, I didn't put it in here. It is a Lee Jeans ad campaign where it is uh, um, models hired because they look like they were under 18, a boy and a girl, in very sexually explicit ads. Technically, this is about with a, like a pornographer taking pictures of them and the girl in bed with the pornographer. And that was the Lee Jeans ad campaign. And this was called corporate pedophilia. It was deemed OK because the models were 18. They were clearly portrayed to look as if and hired because they didn't look as if they were. So 
I also thought it was very cool. I don't know if you do have Burger Kings around here. Uh, I don't know if they did the SpongeBob ad that showed the, like the commercially it looked like prostituted women with uh, in the background with the SpongeBob doing harassing kinds of or with the Burger King guy doing the really inappropriate things. Well, actually, and then you got the SpongeBob um, uh, toys. You know the reason they want this stuff. They actually had individual Burger Kings say, I'm sorry, we don't have any toys available because we will not buy into this campaign. That affects their bottom line, but it upholds a community standard. And one of the places I heard about a lot of people started going to them. Use your spheres of influence. We all have them. We're reaching out to business leaders, advertising leaders, our policy leaders, our faith leaders, our healthcare leaders, and say, what is your role in prevention? This was one of our, um, a county commissioner. Never heard anything about this. He heard me when I was talking out in Washington, D.C. about countering normalization of sexual harm. He said, oh my gosh, as a policy leader, I have to do something about this. I don't know anything about this. My transportation's my issue. I don't even like talking about sex, and I don't know anything about sexual violence, but this is awful. And I was like, he was lit. And he never let up, and he hasn't let up for three years. He has been one of our biggest champions. And what he says, then he went and started talking about this, and he said, where are the men? Where are the men? We need more men. And then he went on his fishing. He talked about this. He got together with his guys. He talked about this. He said, you know, I'm not as popular as I used to be. <laughs> but we need to talk about this. And he just started seeing these things about how his children, his boys and girls, were treated differently in ways. And his girl was being honored in an athletic event. And now you'll know what's coming with this. The boy athletes got sweatshirts. The girl athletes got sweatpants. Where was the writing on their sweatpants? Across their boxes. No other parents had a problem with this. And he said, this is not OK. And they said, oh, really? Commissioner McDonough, I think you need a break. He said, no, this is not OK. We don't do this to our boys. We don't do this to our boys. So they said, OK, we'll do it for the boys. So they did. Guess who didn't buy any? The boys. And the parents of the boys. But the parents of the girls did. We need a wake up call. And we had to have a discussion, though. It's not a bad, you're stupid or shame. It's like, think about how we've come to accept this. And why do we do this to our girls that we direct them to have their buttocks be seen and looked at and not to our boys? How can we have equality and respect and regard as long as we do stuff like this? But I loved his line, because hockey is really big in our state, that we need to make talking about this as easy as talking about hockey. We all have influence. We need to use it in positive ways. We did a campaign where we featured people making small acts of peacemaking in small ways. And one of them was Bobby Brown, although his was not small. Bobby was going to be the first person in his family going to college for academic and um, athletic abilities. He was, he was shot in a drive-by shooting. This was a community that they went back at each other all of the time. And instead, he and his mom, his single mom, his very, they had no money. They had strong values. They had strong love. She said, no more. No more violence. They, he was never violent anyway. This was a, a, was, he was an accidental hit that also hit his sister and went into the baby's, um, the baby's uh, baby seat, car seat, uh, and lodged there. So the baby wasn't hurt. His sister recovered. Bob's, Bobby's permanently in a wheelchair. So he lost his athletic scholarship. Instead of revenge, or instead of he stopped all relatives from any revenge, he started a beyond the Bobby, a beyond uh, the court Bobby Brown basketball clinic. And he went in his wheelchair and he reached out to all these young boys he was teaching already and said, dream your dreams if that dream is athleticism, but know there's more to life. And use your influence in a positive way. Now, this mom, when the Australia group silenced the academicians and threatened them with a lawsuit for calling that stuff corporate pedophilia. They couldn't, they had to be silenced. This mom, who was also a comedian, dressed like a cross between a Barbie doll, a Bratz doll, and a Playboy bunny, and went out and did presentations on billboards she saw around her community that she hated and what the corporation said when she complained, which was, gee, we haven't heard anything else. What's your problem? So she just wrote them all down, put them on the website, called with the press. Here's the billboard. Here's what the corporation said. She started getting a lot of attention. And because she was dressed like a cross between a Playboy Bunny, a Bradston, and a Barbie doll, media loved her. And then she could say her spiel. 
So I thought, well, that's really creative. <laughs> I, you know, I had one other dad. I don't recommend this. But he said he was just really livid at his daughter who was pushing the limits like, you know, was her age-appropriate thing. He got that. But she, he found out after he got a complaint from the principal about how his daughter dressed, who he thought dressed in perfectly appropriate ways, and he went after the principal till she started saying things. And he said, she doesn't dress like that. He said, every day. Lo and behold, she left the house. The makeup came out. The clothes came off. She had double layers. He had no idea. So he tells her now, so you know, that's out of the bag. She knows. The next day she comes out. She's so mad at him. She comes out dressed like that. He said, go change. And he's late for a meeting. She goes upstairs, takes her sweet time, comes down 10 minutes later, dressed the same way. He lets her get in the car. He brings her to school. I thought, what's the point of this story? So that night, she comes out of school, and there's a car. She can't see it, because there's so many kids in front of it, hooting and hollering. And there is her father, in a shirt up to here, <laughs> in shorts down to here, rolled up to there, going, honey, over here. She's like, oh, you look disgusting. How can you embarrass me in this way? And he said, exactly my point, get in the car. I said, no, I'm not going to recommend that, but boy, that's creative. <laughs> um, parents do all kinds of things. So our messages are, in a more proactive, less shaming way, I mean, maybe less creative, to point out the harms and the manipulations in these media messages, to look at who is profiting at, your, at our loss. And, the need, and that's why we need to limit this. Let's talk about your brain development and your physical development so you know what's going on so I can help you navigate this because there's reasons for this. Most importantly, I want you to know I don't expect you to, to in any way cause sexual or emotional or physical harm to anyone else. Really value how you treat other people and we expect that humane treatment. The proudest I could be of you is not how much money you make, but how you treat other people. And we want you to be able to speak up and out when you see harm. Now, if you're afraid, you can just support the person that was harmed. You can tell somebody else to get help. Or you might speak up right then and there. Because the more people that speak up, the more it'll start. And if you were the one being bullied, you'd hope that other people would speak up. Teach. Um, you certainly need to know how to minimize your risks. But we want to have those messages, again, go to not causing the harm. We need to engage men as champions of prevention at all ages to we had the one young woman gave me the line of, you made it my business when she spoke up. And I thought, that is so good. You made it my business when I knew harm was happening. It was my business. It's a lot like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you're tired. You quit when the gorilla's tired. <laughs> because we are on a mission here to take back our own and our children's sexuality, which has been hijacked. Sex sells is not an excuse. Adults have a responsibility. It is not children making marketing and buying this stuff or allowing the buying of it. It might be just the way it is, but it's not the way it should be. It's not the way it has to be. We can change this. Our children's health is not for sale. Most places of the world talk about this as children's rights and human rights, and that's very important. Our children have rights. We have rights. We need to turn the world around for our children. I am asking you tonight to be part of creating the kind of world that we want to live in and we want our children to develop and grow up in.